I've had a few people tell me that cycling through the centre of Iceland is a dumb idea. It was at this stage that I began to see their point. So how did we get here? I've been bike packing and bike touring for a few years now. Nothing too serious. My gear is cheap and I rarely train. In the world of adventure cycling, there is a route I think that reigns supreme. The Iceland Divide. Not only is the terrain like nothing else, but it scores a 9 out of 10 difficulty on bikepacking.com. So if you somehow manage to finish it, you get some serious bragging rights. I knew there was no chance I could finish this alone. Fortunately, I had two school friends as mad as me. Enter Jamie and Jason. Jamie studied advanced maths in Germany and quickly got to work calculating the best route possible. Instead of the original 500 km divide, Jamie had cooked up a 1000 km odyssey, east to west, north to south. Jason was also a formidable cyclist. He never breaks his sweat, even up the steepest of climbs. Maybe that's due to him being the only one who actually trains, but who knows. We also had a last minute wild card entry, Jens Christian Christensen. Despite being Danish, I wouldn't say his cycling ability parallels that of Vingegaard. The man didn't even own a bike until a week before the trip. This is the test drive. I've only just got my bike in order. But Christian studies medicine, so we thought he might be able to secure some European grade painkillers that would prove essential for the trip. Finally, there's me. I'm not the fastest or the smartest, but I hold the camera, so I get to tell the story. Let's go. A few trains and planes, and we had reached our start point of Egelstedith in Iceland's east. Looking back, I hadn't given much thought to how difficult bikepacking Iceland might be. I'm no stranger to a tough day in the saddle, but day one of Iceland was going to be a whole other story. Iceland was gonna kick our asses. We just didn't know it yet. Saviour was this lovely lady from Frankfurt who pulled over with tea in hand to help a couple of poor cyclists. Progress had been slow due to the infamous Icelandic headwind. You join us at 63 kilometres with 30 kilometres to go. Hurting but optimistic. Beyond a tough day, like this man's face. Like it's freezing, like it's just cold, it's wet, you know, it's tough. It's tough. But nothing, uh, a big hot chocolate and uh, rum won't fix. Cut to hot chocolate and rum. Unfortunately, we would not be cutting to hot chocolate and rum. Instead, our route had us diverting from the main road, going 30 kilometres into the Icelandic desert, where things went from bad to worse. Literally frozen to the bone. I don't have much footage from this point on. My hands and feet were completely numb, and because of the extreme weather, none of us could even afford to stop for more than a few moments. It was really here that my thoughts went from, damn, this trip is really tough, to, damn, we have to get out of here right freaking now. We might be able to see Christian going through there. The man's resorted to pushing. I'm guessing we've got about 15k, something like that to go. Um, Here's Jamie. You can't, you have no idea. I can't even begin to describe to you, but there's snow up there. We've ridden all day, we're so wet. It's like two, three, four, five degrees, something like that. Soaked to the bone. I can't even feel anything anymore. 
I don't care. I don't know if I should be worried about that, but ah, this is it. Why you do it? We did end up making that campsite. In hindsight, we should have just had better gear. Rain pants and dishwashing gloves are a must in Iceland. Don't be like me and only pack shorts. Still, I don't think all the gear in the world would have made it easy. When the weather goes bad in Iceland, you are just best to stay inside. Foolishly, we had other ideas. Which is different. The feet are frozen, but give you a look at this. There isn't really much to say about day two. The entire section was really just a 100 kilometer grind on the ring road. It rained a little less, but honestly, that makes little difference when everything you own is already wet. We had lunch at the only structure we saw during the entire day. What can I say? It's not always glamorous. Anyway, I won't dwell on it. Let's get to the exciting stuff instead. Day three, that's the weather. It's basically been like this the whole time. Actually, it's been worse than this, to be honest. This is good. This is actually sunny. <laughs> I'm guessing I four, four. Oh, look, we can see that, yeah. I'm guessing four to six degrees, something like that. Feels like zero. Feels like zero. It's cold as fuck. All trudging along. 100k. Mate, Jamie's chewing at the bit. He's angry. He's angry. <laughs> he can't wait to get there. All right. Oh, this ramen tonight's gonna be good. Mate. Jason led the pack off as per usual, with Jamie pulling off some serious maneuvers just to keep in the draft. How we go with this? Fucking crazy. We left the ring road and its heavy but courteous traffic behind. After a bit of liquid motivation, we reached the top and met this Japanese chap. If you're hesitating to take a trip due to a lack of gear, have a go at this. Just spectacular. Anyway, we were at the top. So fire up your best royalty-free music, because here comes the descent. made the first big checkpoint of the trip, but not without some problems. Jamie's knee had completely blown out. Christian was performing dental surgery on himself. Really, the only man who was going strong was Jason. It's comical to think now that we had planned for this to be the easy part of the trip. We had just one day to pull ourselves together before we entered the Icelandic interior. We left Orkariri after a rest day. We even managed to catch a glimpse of the rare Icelandic sun. However, our celebrations were dampened as we faced the biggest setback of the entire trip so far, early on day four. After cycling through Kyrgyzstan with no problems, Jamie had unexpectedly faced injury. Jamie's a hard man, but even he could not outcycle a bad knee. Facing no other option, it was back to Reykjavik for Jamie. Losing him was a huge blow to morale, as we'd lost the member of the group with the most intimate knowledge of the route. We said our goodbyes, we told the map man that we would do it proud, and even overlay some sad music over his departure. Alright, see ya. Take it easy everyone. Good actually going. We still had a hundred kilometers to cycle, so let's just get on with it.
After not long, asphalt turned to dirt and we entered the infamous Icelandic divide. The last three days of bikepacking will show you it can be a horrendous hobby. But when you get a day with a tailwind and a road with no traffic, it's just magic. Davies has been carrying the boats and the logs all day. 110 kilometers. We're finishing up on pretty hard terrain. Maybe about 2.5 k's away from a couple of rums. You love to see it. did drink rum that night, and I fell asleep inside a warm hut, a happy man. It was a late start for us on day five. Perhaps it was the liquor from the previous night, or a growing overconfidence with the terrain. Iceland was about to yet again punish us, presenting us with a new type of obstacle, a lava field. The terrain following Botany Hut was both difficult to ride and hard to navigate. There isn't a path per se, but just a general direction you should head. We were making a snail's pace and I was worried that if this continued, we wouldn't reach the finish line. Conditions improved, but we quickly realised we would not make our intended destination and instead had to opt for an earlier hut. By taking that earlier hut, we were now officially behind schedule. We were in the middle of Iceland, down our map man, facing unknown conditions and deteriorating weather. It's fair to say anxieties were high. We knew we had to make the next section of the trip count to keep the adventure alive. We were bombing descents in this alien terrain like nothing could go wrong. Of course, that's not how it works. Jason had realised that his entire derailleur was hanging loose. Truly a bike packer's nightmare. Upon closer inspection, we realised it wasn't the derailleur hanger itself that was broken, but the bolt had come out. This was truly a massive problem for us, for I had a spare derailleur hanger, but no bolt. Jason thought he was in the same camp as well, so Christian and I began the long walk up the hill to find one bolt in a sea of gravel. The chances weren't looking good. It truly was a needle in a haystack situation, but if we couldn't find ourselves a bolt, Jason would have to cut his chain and ride single speed for the rest of the trip. I don't even know if it was possible.